أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم صلى الله على محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم رضيت بالله ربا وبالإسلام دينا وبمحمد صلى الله عليه وسلم رسولا ونبيا ربا أعوذ بك من همزات الشياطين وأعوذ بك رب أن يحضرون ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم Continuing on with the Prophet عليه الصلاة والسلام's military legacy legendary that is um it is a legendary legacy that he has left behind we are in the biography of sayyidina abu bakr siddiq radiyallahu anhu page number 300 this is after uh, discussing his judicial system we're entering into the hierarchy or the uh, appointees of uh, provinces we also mentioned that the fourth is ali and as zubair reacted or their reaction to Abu Bakr's Khalifat. So much has been made of this primarily by the Rafida sect concerning narrations which describe how both Zubair ibn al-Awwam and Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu delayed pledging allegiance to Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu. Almost all of those narrations, however, are not authentic. The one exception is a narration that was revealed by Ibn Abbas who said verily Ali and Zubair and others who were with them stayed behind in the house of Fatima bint Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. There were there for a reason a number of people from Al-Muhajirin and Ali ibn Abi Talib was one of them, were in charge of making preparations for the burial of Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Their primary duties involved washing the Prophet alayhi salatu wa sallam and wrapping him up in a shroud. This information is based not on mere conjuncture or conjecture, but on a narration that was revealed by Salim ibn Ubaid, radiallahu anhu, according to that narration of Bakr Siddiq said to Ali and the other members of the Prophet's household, busy yourself with the affairs of the burial preparations, your companion. Abu Bakr Siddiq then ordered them to wash the Prophet alayhi remains. It is important to understand that the Prophet ﷺ had just passed and so, yes, some people had to concern themselves with the future course of the Muslim nation but others had to busy themselves with making preparations for the Prophet ﷺ burial. As a result, it was on the day after the Prophet ﷺ's passing, which was Tuesday, that Azubair ibn al-Awwam and Ali ibn Abi Talib pledged allegiance to Abu Bakr Siddiq. Abu Sa'id al-Qudri radiallahu anhu said, When Abu Bakr al-Siddiq climbed the pulpit, he, lo- he looked at the faces of the people who were before him. Not finding Azubair ibn al-Awwam anywhere among the crowd, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq summoned for him to come. When Zubair radiallahu anhu came a short while later, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq said to him, O cousin and helper of the Messenger of Allah, do you want to break the stick of the Muslims? Example, do you want to be the cause of disunity? Zubair said, there is no blame upon you for what you say, O Khalifa of Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, after which he stood up and pledged allegiance to Abu Bakr Siddiq. Abu Bakr then looked in the faces of the crowd, and not finding Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu anywhere among them, summoned for him to come. When Ali radiallahu anhu came a short while later, Abu Bakr Siddiq said, O cousin of the Messenger of Allah, do you want to break the stick of the Muslims? Example, do you want to cause this unity as well? Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu responded, There is no blame upon you for what you say, O Khalifa of Allah's Messenger, after which he stood up and pledged allegiance to Abu Bakr Siddiq. This authentic narration was deemed so important by Imam Muslim ibn al-Hajjaj, the compiler of the second most authentic hadith compilation, Sahih Muslim, that he went to his shaykh, Imam al-Hafiz Muhammad ibn Ishaq al-Khuzaymah, and ask him about it, al Khuzayma wrote out the hadith for him and read it for him, speaking figuratively. Imam Muslim said that this hadith is worth a badana, a large cow that is slaughtered in Mecca. Example, the hadith is something of great value. Ibn Khuzayma responded, the hadith is not equal to the badama only, but rather it is worth more. Instead, it is equal to the badara. Badara, a bag that contains 1,000 or 10,000 dinars, or 
In other words, this hadith is priceless treasures of great importance. Commenting on Abu Sa'id's above mentioned narration, Ibn Kathir, may Allah have mercy on him, said, The chain of this narration is both authentic and correctly memorized, and the hadith imparts very important information. Either one or two days after the Prophet ﷺ's demise, Allah Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu pledged allegiance to Abu Bakr Siddiq. And this is certainly true, for throughout the duration of Abu Bakr's Khalifa, Ali radiallahu anhu always remained in the, in the close company of Abu Bakr Siddiq. In fact, he never missed performing a single prayer behind him. According to another narration, Habib ibn Abu Thabit said, Ali ibn Abi Talib was in his house when a man went to him and said Abu Bakr has sat down in order to take pledge of allegiance from people. At that very moment, Ali radiallahu anhu was dressed casually wearing only a long shirt with no longer garment or robe above it. But he was in a rush for he did not want to delay pledging allegiance to Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu and so without bothering to put on the rest of his attire, he radiallahu anhu went out to the masjid. Once he was there, he sat down and asked someone to bring his robe for him. Some people brought it for him and he wore it over his shirt. According to yet another account, Amr bin Harith asked Sa'id ibn Zayd radiallahu anhu, Did you witness the death of Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? To which he replied, Yes. When Sa'id replied, Yes. When were the pledges of allegiance made to Abu Bakr, Amr asked, the day on which the Messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala passed, Sa'id said the Muslims dislike for even a part of the day to pass by without them being united as a group under a single leader. Did anyone abstain from pledging allegiance to Abu Bakr Amr As? No, Sa'id said the only people who abstained from pledging allegiance to him were the apostates or those who were on the verge of apostatizing. Allah saved the Ansar from the fate and united them under him, Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu, and they pledge allegiance to him. Did anyone from the Muhajirin abstain from pledging allegiance to him? Amr asked. No, said Sa'id. The people of the Muhajirin came in groups one after another in order to pledge allegiance to him. As for Ali, he remained loyal and sincere to Abu Bakr Siddiq throughout the duration of his Khalifat. He radiallahu anhu was always there to offer his sincere counsel and assistance. Ibn Kathir, may Allah ta'ala have mercy on him and many others from the people of knowledge are of the view that Ali radiallahu anhu renewed his pledge of allegiance to Abu Bakr Siddiq six months after, excuse me, the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam passed. Or in other words, just after the uh, passing of Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anha, the second pledge of allegiance is related in various or is related in various authentic narrations. Ali radiallahu anhu drove not to the further his personal interests but the interests of all Muslims. As such, he sincerely wanted to help Abu Bakr Siddiq in any way possible. Furthermore, Ali understood that as long as Abu Bakr Siddiq was in charge of the Muslim nation, Muslims would continue to enjoy safety and prosperity. Ali radiallahu anhu displayed his sincere and loyal feelings for the Muslim army, went out to fight the apostates in Dil Qisa, which was situated a few leagues away from Al Madina. Abu Bakr Siddiq was determined to take the fight to the apostates, and he resolved not just to direct the overall war efforts against them, but to also go and fight them himself at Dil Qisa. It goes without saying that his preparation or his participation in the impending battles at Dil Qisa endangered his life in a very real way. Nonetheless, he was determined to go. Ibn Umar radiallahu anhu reported that when Abu Bakr Siddiq arrived in Dil Qisa and was seated upright on his riding animal, Ali ibn Abi Talib took hold of the camel's reins and said, Where are you going, O Khalifa of Allah's Messenger? I will say to you, what the Messenger of Allah said on the day of Uhud, pull in your sword and do not bereave it of yourself and return to al Madina. For by Allah, if we become bereaved of you, Al-Islam, Al-Islam will never have a system 
of rule on earth. Perhaps that Ali ibn Abi Talib meant by this is that if Abu Bakr Siddiq passed, the apostates would come out victorious in their war against the Muslims. Heeding Ali's words, Abu Bakr Siddiq returned to Al Madina. The point here is that had Ali not been happy with Abu Bakr Siddiq's appointment to the Khalifa and had he been forced into pledging allegiance to him. He had just come across the perfect opportunity to rid himself of him. He radiallahu anhu could have left well enough alone and allowed Abu Bakr Siddiq to do what he wanted. Chances were that Abu Bakr Siddiq would have died and the seat of the Khalifa would be there for the taking. But the foregoing is nothing but a flight of fantasy. Ali ibn Abi Talib was too noble and pious to have had such thought. What Ali radiallahu anhu wanted most was the prosperity of Muslim nation and he radiallahu anhu knew maximum prosperity was going to be achieved only with Abu Bakr at the helm of the nation. Which is why he did his utmost to advise Abu Bakr Siddiq to protect him from harm. May Allah be pleased with Abu Bakr Siddiq, Ali and Azubayr and all of the Prophet Ali salatu companions. Ameen. The fifth uh, point we wanted to mention uh, says uh, we as a group of prophets are not inherited from rather what we leave behind is charity. I think this is going to have reference in uh, the Fadak, I believe so. Speaking about what happened about the death of the Prophet after the passing of the Prophet والسلام, Aisha said uh, anha, Fatima and Al-Abbas went to Abu Bakr, seeking out their share of inheritance from the estate of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. During that particular visit, they were demanding their land in Fadak, yes, as well as their share of the spoils from Khaybar. Abu Bakr said to them, I heard the Messenger of Allah say, لا نورث ما تركنا صدقة إنما يأكله آل محمد من هذا المال. We are not inherited from rather what we leave behind is charity. According to an account, Abu Bakr Siddiq said there is nothing that the Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم applied during his lifetime except I apply it as well. I fear that if I were to abandon even a single thing that he did, I would end up going astray. In another narration, one that is also related in Bukhari, Aisha radiallahu anha said, when the Messenger of Allah passed, his wives wanted to send Uthman ibn Affan to Abu Bakr Siddiq so they could ask him for their share of the Prophet alayhi state. It appears based on the wording of the narration that Aisha radiallahu anha was there when Uthman visited Abu Bakr Siddiq for it is mentioned in the nation that she radiallahu anha in the narration, excuse me, that she radiallahu anha did not the messenger say, she radiallahu anha said, did not the messenger say, la nurithu ma tarakna sadaqatun. We are not inherited from, rather what we leave behind is charity. It was magnanimous and selfless for Aisha to have said these words for she radiallahu anha being a wife of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam stood to gain a great deal if relatives were allowed to inherit from the Prophet alayhi salatu wa salam. In yet another narration Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu reported the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said لا يقتسموا ورثتي دينارا ما تركت بعد نفقة النساء ومؤونة عاملي فهو صدقة Let not my inheritors distribute even a single dinar among themselves Whatever remains after my wife's expenses and my workers provisions are taken care of is for charity According to one account, Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu said, there is nothing that the Messenger of Allah applied during that time. So I think we covered this one. So the next is going to be page number 306. Yes, so 306 is where we're picking up from. This is Abu Bakr Siddiq was not trying to deprive Fatima radiallahu anha of what was rightfully hers. To the contrary, he radiallahu anhu simply wanted to do what was the right thing to do in, in his case that meant following the command of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and distributing the remaining of his estate not to his bereaved wife, family members 
but to charitable causes. Abu Bakr Siddiq afterwards backed up what he said with a clear proof. The hadith in which the Prophet ﷺ clearly stated that no one was to inherit his wealth. Fatima radiallahu anha desisted from arguing or from pursuing the matter any further. Instead, she radiallahu anha accepted the truth and submitted to the Prophet ﷺ's command. For as Ibn Qatiba put it, no fault should be imputed to Fatima for having argued with Abu Bakr about the estate of the Prophet ﷺ, especially considering the fact that she had no knowledge about what the Messenger of Allah Ta'ala had said. Regarding the matter, she knew that the children inherit from their parents and she had no reason to think that she was an exception. But when, but then when Abu Bakr Siddiq informed her about that, the Prophet ﷺ had said, she held back her tongue and desisted from arguing the matter any further. Al-Qadi Iyad Added, when Fatima radiallahu anha learned of the hadith and was explained its meaning, she abandoned her previous view that she had the right to inherit from the Prophet wasalam, estate. And it is important to note that after this incident occurred, neither she nor her children ever repeated their demand that they should be given a share of the Prophet wasalam's estate. Years later, Ali radiallahu anhu became khalifa of the muslim nation and it is very telling fact that he did not change abu bakr and umar's policy regarding the prophet alayhi salatu estate who had proved that he radiallahu anhu was in complete agreement with them hamad ibn ishaq wrote in regards to this issue it is important to understand that abu bakr siddiq and umar radiallahu anhu stood to gain the most if they agreed to distribute the Prophet ﷺ estate. It is because both of their daughters Aisha and Hafsa were married to the Prophet ﷺ and both of them would have received a handsome share of the Prophet ﷺ's estate. But rather than going after personal gains, Abu Bakr and Umar who preferred to obeying the command of Allah and his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa and so they forbade Aisha and Hafsa and others from taking a share of the Prophet wasalam, estate. And Abu Bakr and Umar Siddiq radiallahu anhu decided to distribute the Prophet's estate. Both of them would not only gain monetarily but also both of them would have been able to proudly say our daughters are the inheritors of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa and what honor could be greater than that. And so, their having refused to distribute the Prophet wasalam, estate was a testament to their sincerity and integrity. Some people have made the claim that once Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu refused to distribute the Prophet wasalam, estate, Fatim radiallahu anha became so angry that she refused to speak to him until she passed away. This claim is fabricated one for two Main reasons, having lost her father and the noblest human being to have ever lived. Fatima radiallahu anha was overcome with grief, which is not surprising considering the fact that all calamities pale, pale in comparison to the death of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Furthermore, Fatima fell ill and was confined to her bed. The illness took up all of her time. As, she, as a result, she not, was not able to participate in affairs that affected herself and her family. It goes without saying, therefore, that she did not have the energy or time or ability to go out and meet the Khalifa. When she knew had not a moment, when she knew that she did not have a moment to spare, since he was so busy looking after the affairs of the nation and overseeing the war against the apostates, Fatima radiallahu anha knew that she was going to pass away sooner rather than later for the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had informed her that she would be the first among his relatives to catch up with him. A person that knows she is about to pass away is unlikely to think about worldly matters and as Al-Mulahab put it, no one has. Related that Abu Bakr Siddiq and Fatima met and then refused to extend greetings of peace to one another. The two of them were not purposefully avoiding one another. Instead, they did not meet often because Fatima was confined to her home because of her illness. 
Al Bayhaqi related by way of Ash'abi that Abu Bakr Siddiq visited Fatima during the period of her illness. When he radiallahu anhu went to pay her a visit, Ali said, Here is Abu Bakr asking permission to enter upon you. She said, Would you like for me to grant him permission? Ali said, Yes. Upon which she announced that Abu Bakr Siddiq could enter. Abu Bakr Siddiq then entered and continued to say conciliatory things to her until she became pleased. No one should have any doubts. Therefore, concerning Fatima's attitude towards Abu Bakr Siddiq, and one should keep in mind that it was Abu Bakr Siddiq who said, By Allah, it is more pleasing to me to keep good relations with the relatives of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam than to keep good relations with my own relatives. It is an established historical fact that throughout the duration of his Khalifa, Abu Bakr Siddiq would give the members of the Prophet ﷺ's house for their full due from the spoils of war, as well as from the wealth of Fadak and Khaybar. The only occasion on which he seemingly shortchanged them was when he refused to distribute the Prophet ﷺ's estate. And even that he did so based on what the Messenger of Allah ﷺ had said. The following statements have been related from two prominent members of the Prophet's household, Muhammad ibn Ali ibn al Hussein, who was well known by the name Muhammad al Baqir, and Zayd ibn Ali concerning his dealings with our father Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu, was not known to have wronged or should change them in the least, nor were they our fathers even remotely suspicious that. He was guilty of any unfairness or wrongdoing. According to those famous of those famous of accounts, Fatima radiallahu anhu anha passed on six months after she became bereaved of her father on his deathbed, having told her that she would be the first to catch up with him. And in the world of the hereafter, the Prophet ﷺ consoled her, saying, Ama tardayna, ama أن تكوني سيدتي نساء أهل الجنة. Are you not pleased to be the chief of the women dwellers of paradise? The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said this to her on the evening of Monday, the Ramadan in the year of eleven after Hijriya. It is reported that Ali ibn Ali ibn al Hussein said Fatima رضي الله عنها passed between Maghrib and Al Isha, present. By her side were Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Zubair, and Abdurrahman ibn Awf radiallahu anhum. When her body was placed in preparation for her funeral prayer, Ali radiallahu anhu stepped forward, O Abu Bakr, and lead us in the prayer. Ali stepped forward, O Abu Bakr, and lead us in prayer, a humble gesture on part of Ali, and one of that was reciprocated by Abu Bakr who said, Shall I do so while you are present, O Abu Hassan? Ali radiallahu anhu said, Yes, step forward, for by Allah none other than you shall pray over her. And so Abu Bakr Siddiq prayed over her, and she was buried during the night. According to one particular account, Abu Bakr as Siddiq prayed over Fatima bint Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And said Takbir, Allahu Akbar, Allah is the greatest over her four times. According to the narration of Muslim, however, it was Ali ibn Abi Talib who led Fatima's funeral prayer. So there is a difference of opinion between the two scholars of Hadith. Without a doubt, Abu Bakr's relationship with the members of the Prophet Wasallam's household was best described as one of mutual love and respect. As was befitting of both of them and him, he had, radiallahu anhu, an especially loving and trusting relationship with Ali ibn Abi Talib, who one should not be surprised to learn to name one of his sons Abu Bakr as Siddiq. And after Abu Bakr as Siddiq passed, Ali took his son Muhammad into his household, ibn Abi Bakr. I'm thinking this is, yes, yeah, says Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr, radiallahu anhu, raising him and taking good care of him. Upon becoming Khalifa himself, Ali selected Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr to be one of his governors, a decision for which Ali paid a heavy price and was greatly criticized. Inshallah, we will pick up from here. Uh, the next uh, section will be going into 
the uh, affair of Osama's army so and Abu Bakr's war against the apostates. So this will probably possibly be the the uh, the military expeditions and and uh, really battles uh, head on battles that uh, Abu Bakr Siddiq himself will lead. Uh, also, it will be discussing the situation of Osama's army, which was the last army that the Prophet ﷺ had put together prior to him passing. Um, inshallah, we will uh, talk more also as we go forward into the extra pages. We are now on page number 312. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik wa tabarak asm rabbik wa ta'ala jadduk wa la ilaha ghayruk wa la hawla wa la quwwata illa billahi al-aliyu al-azim. سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون السلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين